we are going to look at uh, the second part of the lectures on receptors of spatial sensations. We've seen the first part, we've looked at olfactory and uh, taste sensations. In this second part, we are going to focus on auditory and vestibular sensations. But of course, that means that we are going to look at the ear itself. So our key objective is to describe the anatomy of the ear. So we'll describe the anatomy of the outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. And then we'll also explain the pathways for auditory as well as vestibular mechanisms. Let's start by talking about anatomy of the ear. In terms of where the ear is found, most parts of the ear are housed by the temporal bone. So remember the bones of the skull, the bone near the ear, there is the temporal bone, and that's the one that houses most parts of the ear. We can describe the ear as having three anatomical parts, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. This is the outer ear, this is the middle ear, and that's the inner ear. Before we go far, I have some questions for you. So there are three questions. That is the first one, sorry. That's the first one. So I'm giving you 30 seconds. I want you to respond in the chat regarding that question. Uh, okay, most of you have replied to that. That's the second one. So I'm calling that question two. Again, feel free to respond in the chat. You have 30 seconds. Okay, the last question. I'll call that question three. Again, feel free to respond to question three. Okay, that should be it, I'll close it now. I've seen your varied responses. Uh, on the first one, most of you got that right. On the second and the third one, uh, multiple responses, multi heterogeneous, but let's go through so that you'll answer yourself in the process. Let's begin with the outer ear. The outer ear is also what we call the external ear. It consists of two things. This one here, the pin of the ear, and that one, the external auditory meters. You can call it external acoustic meters, or you can call it the auditory canal. So we have the auditory canal and the pin of the ear. We know that uh, the pin itself is basically made up of elastic cartilage on most parts of it. 
but on this lower part doesn't have cartilage. And that cartilage is lined by basically skin. So that is with regard to the pinna. With regard to the auditory canal, the auditory canal is lined by hairy skin. The skin of the auditory canal contain several sebaceous glands as well as ceruminous glands. The ceruminous glands are modified sweat glands. They are modified apocrine sweat glands. These modified apocrine sweat glands produce cerumen, which is the wax of the ear. So they are found within the auditory canal. The purpose of the outer ear is to collect sound waves, as most of you indicated in question one. It will collect sound waves from the external environment and converge those waves to the tympanic membrane, or what we call the eardrum. Why do sound waves go to the eardrum? The role of the eardrum is to convert the sound waves to vibration waves. So it transduces sorry, physical energy from one form of physical energy to another form of physical energy. That therefore does not make it to become the receptor for hearing. Because for you to be a receptor, sensory receptor, you must convert physical energy to electrical energy. This one is converting one energy from one physical form to another physical form. But that conversion is vital for hearing. So the eardrum just converts sound waves to vibration energy. It is important to note that even though the sounds will come from the whole environment and converge through this one, the eardrum itself is a tiny space. Now what happens is that the auditory canal tries to concentrate the waves basically, so that when they hit on the eardrum, the impact of it is bigger on the eardrum. So that is the external ear. Now we can talk about the middle ear. The other name given to the middle ear is the tympanic cavity. The tympanic cavity extends from the eardrum laterally to two openings on its medial wall, which we call the oval window and the round window. So the oval and round window are medial, which helps separate the middle ear and the inner ear. The tympanic membrane is lateral, helping separate the middle ear from the outer ear. The space there is called the tympanic cavity. The tympanic cavity contains some small bones which exist in the form of a chain, and so we call it the ossicular chain. The ossicular chain consists of the first one, malleus, second one, incus, and the third one, stapes. So we have the malleus, incus, and stapes in that order. The way they are arranged is in such a way that as vibration passes through the circular chain, and so the circular chain transmits the vibration. As the circular chain transmits the vibration, it will also amplify the vibration. So the aim is to amplify the vibration. The amplification of the vibration from a physics point of view is on two account. One is the arrangement of the bones, how the bones are joining themselves. It gives the option of a lot of oscillations as we go along. But two, the surface area of the eardrum compared to the surface area of the oval window. 
the eardrum is much bigger than the oval window. So through that, there'll also be some form of amplification of the vibration when it enters the oval window side. That's more about physics. Okay. Now, important to note is that the middle ear has a connection that takes it to the pharynx. What I mean is that there's a channel that communicates directly between the middle ear and the pharynx. That connection is what we call the esthetian tube. So it connects the middle ear to your pharynx, specifically nasopharynx, or what you call the throat. Why is that connection there? That connection is there to help equalize the pressure within the middle ear with that of the atmospheric pressure. How is that possible? Remember that uh, the oral cavity, sorry, the pharynx itself will have some pressure. The pressure of the pharynx will be similar to the pressure in the atmosphere. If you open your mouth, if you breathe in and out, the pressure in the nasopharynx and that one in the atmosphere are the same or near the same. And so if that channel is there, it means that the pressure in the nasopharynx, which is atmospheric, will be similar to the pressure in the middle ear. So if you extend that, it means that the pressure here in the middle ear will be the same as the pressure in the outer ear there. The reason why we want the pressure in the middle ear to be the same as the pressure in the outer ear is so that we cannot have bulging of the eardrum in other direction. If the pressure in the outer ear was higher than that on the inner ear, the eardrum will bulge inwards and vice versa. If the pressure inside was more, the eardrum will bulge outwards. Any kind of bulging of the eardrum affects the tension of the eardrum. And uh, if you have a tense eardrum, it will not be very efficient in transduction of sound to vibration energy. So you need no more tension of the eardrum. Okay, so that's the middle ear. And so I hope through that, then you've understood the key functions of the middle ear. One, to amplify vibrations. And two, to maintain normal tension of the eardrum. Okay, now we talk about the inner ear. The inner ear is a little bit complex, but we will talk about the basic structure that is important for our understanding the mechanisms and physiology of hearing. Let's start this way. The inner ear consists of tunnels, tunnels within the temporal bone. The part of the temporal bone that contains the inner ear is called the petrous temporal bone. So it just consists of tunnels within the petrous temporal bone. The system of tunnels within the petrous temporal bone is termed the bony labyrinth. So bony labyrinth refers to the system of tunnels within the petrous temporal bone. Now look at uh, my video, if it's possible for you to do that. So I'm carrying a pen here. This pen has an inner rubber tube, which I can remove as you can see. So there's this inner rubber tube that contain, usually contain ink. Okay, mine doesn't uh, economy. Um, but yes, this inner one usually contain ink. And then we have this outer one that is glassy. So I want you to look at this outer one, the glassy one. 
and imagine the cavity inside that glassy tube. Let's call the cavity within this glassy tube the bony labyrinth, a system of tunnels within the petrous temporal bone. So they're just tunnels. Now, that cavity within the glassy tube, it's not just there, it usually it receives this one. And so we usually have something that goes through that, even in the inner ear. That thing that goes through the bony labyrinth is called the membranous labyrinth. So we have bony labyrinth, the system of tunnels within the petrous temporal bone, and the membranous labyrinth, the system of membranous channels that follow the contour of the bony labyrinth. Now, there's some fluids here to talk about. The bony labyrinth is not just space. It contains some fluid. The fluid it contains is similar to the fluid that is found in the extracellular fluid and the fluid that is found within the CSF. We call that fluid perilymphatic fluid. So imagine this thing containing fluid within it. And then we test this thing as well. Now, this thing is the membranous labyrinth inside that space that contains fluid. Okay, we are coming to that again shortly. So at least at this point in time, you've understood that you have a bony labyrinth and you have a membranous labyrinth. Now the membranous labyrinth, just like uh, I've demonstrated with this particular rubber tube, contain ink inside it. The fluid within the membranous labyrinth is not perilymphatic fluid. The fluid within the membranous labyrinth is similar to the fluid that we find in the intracellular space, at least similar, to the, the, the concentration of potassium and sodium are almost similar. That fluid is called the endolymphatic fluid. So I want you to imagine the ink within this rubber tube being the endolymphatic fluid and close by the rubber tube, then insert it within this larger tube that already was having water. So the water of this glassy tube will be inside the glassy tube, but outside the, the rubber tube, if, if I was to put it in simple terms. That's the arrangement of the inner ear so that you understand what is bony labyrinth and what is membranous labyrinth. Now let's start with the bony labyrinth. What are the components of bony labyrinth? I've told you it's a system of tunnels. The bony labyrinth consists of three components. We have the one I'm pointing right now, which you call the vestibule. From the vestibule, you have a system of channels that uh, one is coiling on itself like that of the shell of a snail, making about three and a half turns, which we call the cochlea. So this is the cochlea. And then we have these other ones. There are three semicircular tunnels that are connected again to the vestibule. We call them semicircular canals. There are three of them. So we call them the semicircular canals. We have semicircular canals, we have the vestibule and we have the cochlea. They are all interconnected. The lumen, the common, they have a common continuous lumen. Within that system of bony labyrinth is the presence of the membranous labyrinth that contain endolymphatic fluid, as I've said. So what are the components of the membranous labyrinth then? 
we have what you call the utricle and the circle. The utricle and the circle are parts of the membranous labyrinth that are contained within the vestibule. So those are contained within the vestibule. Then apart from that, we also have the cochlear duct. The cochlear duct refers to the membranous labyrinth that is contained within the cochlea. So the membranous labyrinth that is found within the cochlea is known as the cochlear duct. It follows the contour of the cochlea. If we trace the fluid within the cochlear duct, that endolymphatic fluid within the cochlear duct, we note that that fluid is continuous, the fluid of the circle. So we can say that the circle is a reservoir for the fluid of the cochlear duct. Similarly, the component of membranous labyrinth that is found within the semicircular canals are known as the semicircular ducts. So these are the semicircular ducts. They follow the contour of the semicircular canals. And I told you that we have three semicircular canals and therefore we have three semicircular ducts. We have one that is in front, one lateral and one posterior. They run in different orientations. They are oriented at about 90 degrees away from one another. They are orthogonal planes, 90 degrees in orthogonal planes. The aim of that is to ensure that uh, they're able to detect motion in all the three planes of the head, coronal, sagittal, and uh, horizontal. So here, So here, duct and semicircular duct. Well, there are other details that I've chosen not to go into so that we can understand the basic anatomy of the inner ear. Okay, I've noted that uh, the, 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 my internet tipped a bit. So let me say that again in summary. The membranous labyrinth contain utricle, circle, cochlear duct, and semicircular ducts. These are the components, the major components of the membranous labyrinth. There are other components of the membranous labyrinth that I've not said, uh, but I've chosen to highlight on this one so that we can just have that basic anatomy of the inner ear. So this image capture for us, the components of the inner ear, both the cochlear duct within the cochlea and the semicircular ducts within the semicircular canals, but also captures for us the utricle and the circle as they are found within the vestibule. I want you to note, and perhaps if you use this other one, the semicircular ducts and canal, that the duct is actually smaller than the canal, that should make sense to you by now, and that the fluid within the duct is endolymphatic fluid, but the fluid outside the duct within the canal is perilymphatic fluid. The perilymphatic fluid is continuous or similar to the extracellular fluid, similar to CSF. Endolymphatic fluid is different from CSF. If you take a cross-section through the cochlea, what are we going to find? If you take a cross-section through the cochlea, we are going to find something that has three cavities. Why are these three cavities? Understand it this way. So this outer one here is the bone. And so the whole of this is the cochlea itself. 
But remember the cochlea contain the cochlear duct. This middle one here is a cochlear duct. It runs within the cochlea. So with the presence of the cochlear duct and perhaps you attached two ends of the cochlear duct to the wall, we will note that the cochlea itself as a whole has three major cavities. So this one here contains the fluid of the cochlear duct that is endolymphatic fluid, but the other two contain the fluid of the perilymph. Basically the fluid that is within the cochlea but out of the cochlear duct. So in cross section, this is how we usually demonstrate the anatomy of the cochlea. We have two, we have three cavities. We call them the scala, scala vestibuli on the upper part, scala media, and scala tympani on the lower part. The scala media is the one that contain the fluid of the cochlear duct. Now within the cochlear duct, we have a delicate structure there that function as the receptor for hearing. That delicate structure is what we call the spiral organ of corti. So the spiral organ of corti is a delicate structure found within the cochlear duct. And it's the one that function as receptor for hearing. It has several cell types, but we can just call them the hair cells, which are the receptor cells. And the rest, the rest we can call them the supporting cells. There are really many types of supporting cells. For the hair cells, there are those which are on the inside and those which are on the outside, but let's not go into that detail. Just call them hair cells. They detect vibrations. And then you have supporting cells, the cells which support them. There are several de delicate membranes within here. As you can see, the membrane separating scalar vestibuli and scalar media is called the vestibular membrane. The membrane separating the scalar media and scalar tympani is called the basilar membrane. The membrane that holds the stereocilia of the hair cells is called the tectorial membrane. Perhaps the, that's the most delicate of them all. I want to note that uh, the spiral organ of Corti receives a nerve that enters it, and the cell bodies of that nerve is somewhere there next to it. This nerve there are basically the cochlear nerve, and these are the cell bodies of the cochlear nerve. They constitute what we call the spiral ganglion. The spiral ganglion contain cell bodies of the cochlear nerve. So with that understanding, in summary, the inner ear contain the cochlear duct, which has the receptor for hearing. That receptor for hearing is what we call the spiral organ of Corti. Now we can talk about the mechanism of hearing. So sound will be in the atmosphere in form of waves that those waves will be transmitted, collected by the outer ear and directed to the eardrum. The purpose of the eardrum is to convert the sound waves to vibration energy. So there'll be vibrations here. As vibration occur, through the ossicular chain, we will have amplification. So the vibrations in the eardrum is transmitted to the, through the ossicular chain. And I told you there are two mechanisms of amplification here. One is the arrangement of the ossicular chain. It makes them have a lot of oscillations as uh, we go away from the eardrum. But apart from that, also based on the ratio of the eardrum and the oval window. There's a lot of amplification of vibration taking place. Okay, once amplification has occurred through the circular chain, the vibration is taken through the oval window and that is directed to the perilymphatic fluid. 
So the perilymphatic fluid, the vibration is within the perilymphatic fluid. The vibration is usually transmitted in that manner, that way, in that order, in that direction. So starting from the oval window, go through the scalar vestibuli, then scala tympani back to the round window. This is the scalar vestibuli. And then this is the scalar tympani all the way to the round window. All right. As vibration follow that channel through the perilymph within scalar vestibuli and then scalar tympani. As vibration go through there, those vibrations are transmitted to the cochlear duct as well. And so it will be received by the endolymph of the cochlear duct. The vibrations within the cochlear duct will be detected by the tectorial membrane. Remember, this is the one that anchor, this is the one that anchor the hair cells which detect hearing. So the vibrations on the tectorial membrane are therefore detected by the hair cells of the spiral organ of court. And that will then be converted to nerve impulses that will be transmitted through the cochlear nerve. Perhaps you're asking yourself, so what's the role of the round window? At least the oval window is the entry of the vibration. Physics tells us that uh, fluid cannot be compressed. You cannot compress fluid. So if this happened so that you have vibration there, that impact will be there. And so the role of the round window is to basically dampen that particular vibration. Other is to not be possible to, com to, to, to cause vibration at the, oval at the oval window if there was no exit damping points because you cannot compress fluid. Great. So that is the mechanism of hearing. Now we can talk about the auditory relay pathway, the neuronal channels that take information from the spiral organ of cortex all the way to the ear. So once hearing vibration has been detected by the hair cells of the spiral organ of cortex, the impulses will be carried through the cochlear nerve. Remember the cochlear nerve is part of the vestibular cochlear nerve, the cranial nerve number eight. The cell bodies of the cochlear nerve constitute what you call the spiral ganglion located just within the middle ear, the inner ear as well. The central processes of the cochlear nerve fibers go all the way to the brain stem, usually at the junction between the pons and the medulla. The synapse within the brainstem in a region we call the cochlear nucleus. So the cochlear nucleus contains cell bodies of the second order neurons, which are in the pathway of hearing. From the cochlear nucleus, the second order neurons will decassette. Now, they form a complex decussation at the level of the brainstem, really, which makes it be given a very special name. The name given to the decussation is very special. We call the trapezoid body, but you don't go into that one. Just understand that this decussation, but a complex form of decussation between the right and the left cochlear nuclei. Now, the information that leaves the cochlear nucleus after the decussation should be headed to the thalamus. And indeed, there are those fibers which go all the way to the thalamus. The region of the thalamus that receive the second order neurons for hearing has a specific name 
we call the medial geniculate body of the thalamus, medial geniculate body of the thalamus. However, many fibers which come from the cochlear nucleus as second order neurons do not really reach the thalamus first. They relay somewhere. They relay within the inferior colliculus of the midbrain. The midbrain has what you call the inferior colliculus where those fibers, most of the second order neuron fibers relay there. The purpose of that relay is uh, two way. One is that the inferior colliculus is the site of uh, auditory reflexes. So we need to know much about that, but also inferior colliculus is believed to have some um, function in terms of localizing sound, knowing the direction of sound, sound localization. So because they also have a function in sound localization, a lot of fibers, second order neuron synapse within the inferior colliculus of midbrain. And that means that the order of neurons that therefore reach the cerebral cortex may not necessarily be third order, but perhaps fourth order neurons, if you are to be strict in terms of naming them. But you can just call them third order neuron in the understanding that uh, you perhaps ignoring the fact that we have the inferior colliculus. Anyway, important to note is that uh, we have inferior colliculus in the path of hearing, and you have medial genital body again in the path of hearing. The neurons that come from the thalamus, whether you want to call them third order or fourth order neurons, will come from the thalamus all the way to the cerebral cortex. The part of the cerebral cortex that receives information regarding sound, the primary auditory cortex is located in the transverse temporal gyri, the gyri of Herschel, area number 41 and 42. Great, so that is auditory pathway. This image capture for you that again, the cochlear nerve within the vestibular cochlear nerve going all the way to the brainstem, there's some synapsing and uh, decussation, which we call the trapezoid body. Then we have projection aided to the thalamus, but there's some relay at the midbrain, inferior collicular of midbrain. Then information go to thalamus. As you can see for hearing, the projections are actually bilateral because of this complex form of decussation at the level of the brainstem. The projections are bilateral, but most of it is contralateral. That is with regard to hearing. Let's now talk about equilibrium pathway as well. Equilibrium information is detected by the equilibrium receptors. The equilibrium receptors are collectively called vestibular apparatus of the ear. These vestibular apparatus of the ear are sensitive to position of the head. The components of the vestibular apparatus are this one. We have the utricle. So the utricle contain receptors within it that detect position of the head. In particular, the utricle detect linear acceleration. Then you have the circular as well, also detecting linear acceleration. So that is change of speed, change of velocity in a straight line of the head. Then we have semicircular ducts. Semicircular ducts detect rotational accelerations in the three planes that you talked about, anterior, lateral, and posterior semicircular ducts having different planes. And so they detect rotational accelerations of the head. When you turn your head, things like that, be detected by semicircular ducts. The information from the vestibular apparatus are relayed to the vestibular, through the vestibular nerve to the brain stem. Now, vestibular nerve is part of the vestibular cochlear nerve, just like the cochlear nerve. Now, this image captures for us something also fundamental to understand about vestibular function. Remember, it's about the position of the head. 
So for us to be aware of that position of the head, then the information need to reach the cerebral cortex, the site of perception. How do we get there? From the vestibular apparatus of the ear, the first order neurons carried within the vestibular nerve terminate within the brain stem. We have what we call the vestibular nuclei within the brain stem. It's a complex of nuclei. We call them vestibular nuclear complex at the brain stem. From there, we have second order neurons that will decassate and then go all the way to the thalamus. And then third order neurons go to the vestibular area. The primary vestibular area of the cerebral cortex is basically part of the postcentral gyrus in the parietal lobe. However, vestibular function, a lot of it is not even the one we are aware about. A lot of it happens subconsciously. For that reason, vestibular function goes to many other places within the brain stem to maintain some specific function. For example, we have projection from the vestibular to the ones that control oculomotor nerve, or let's say the one that control the muscles of the eye. You understand that you must balance your head position with the position of the eye. So you must balance the position of the eyes with your head position. And you don't have to be intentionally doing that. Sometimes it just occurs on itself because of the projections from the ear that go to the neurons that control the muscles of the eye. We also have projection from the vestibular nuclei that go all the way to the spinal cord because again, we need to maintain balance of the trunk with regard to the position of the head. So I'm just saying that we have multiple projections from the vestibular nuclei in addition to the one related to the one going to the cerebral cortex. Great, so that is the story about anatomy of the ear and the mechanisms for hearing and equilibrium. And so that summarizes the second part of the lecture, as I told you, we are going to do. So our third one will be anatomy of the eye and visual mechanism, but we'll stop there for now. Then we look at the third one.